It's the third of our summer specials of the British Broadcasting Century podcast on marvellous authors and the great works they have to tell us about British Broadcasting's century. In the last couple of specials, we've been zooming in on different aspects of later British broadcasting history, the radio girls of late 1920s, the first black British broadcasters, and this time, Edward Sturton, the broadcaster that you will know from several decades worth of BBC broadcasting. He has a marvellous book called Auntie's War, plus another couple of favourite voices on this podcast. And listen out for some genuine audio from the wartime BBC. Keep calm and broadcast on. This is Auntie's War on the British Broadcasting Century. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling. This is London calling. Hello, hello, I'm Paul Carenza. How are you doing? Hope your summer's going well. Eagle-eared listeners will spot that our three summer specials have each been recorded on a different microphone. Well, Paul's been off on his holobobs and sometimes away from the usual mic. Which of the three do you prefer? Let me know. We'll use the favourite. Our third summer special, then, brings us to Auntie's War. And I won't hang about with any long introduction because we've got lots to bring you today. Not only a feature-length chat with Edward Sturton, a marvellous broadcaster and a great writer as well. His book is Auntie's War. I highly recommend it. But we also have a David Hendy, author of the BBC A People's History. You'll hear about D-Day and one person's role in that... <laughs> We've split this episode in two, because we have lots to tell you, not just about the official BBC in World War II, but also about unofficial broadcasting, black propaganda in World War II, too. From Lord Haw Haw to our old friends Hilda Matheson and Peter Eckersley. So in part two of this special episode, join us next time for fake news from 80 years ago, with more from Edward Sturton, as well as Marconi historian Tim Wonder. So don't miss our next episode, supplementary to this one. But for now, here's the BBC in World War II. Delighted to welcome to the podcast now uh, a man who's been a broadcaster and a presenter since, um, well, I think 1979, I think he joined ITN. Yeah, don't, don't remind me. Long time. Let's not go there, shall we? Um, no. uh, but really well known for is BBC uh, broadcasting on it, TV news, Radio 4, World at One. I know him from the Sunday programme, but also writing about the BBC in his fabulous book, Auntie's War, one of many books he's written, of course. Uh, Edward Sturton, thank you for joining us. Pleasure, pleasure. Where to begin? Do we do even talk about um, what led you to, to writing this book, but there's, there's so much to talk about with, within it as well, covering the uh, the BBC's role in, in the Second World War. Um, but what led to it to begin with? Well, uh, oddly enough, it goes back quite a long time to my time as Paris correspondent for the BBC. And we covered a story about a World War II fascist who weirdly had been hidden in French monasteries all over France since the end of the Second World War, right up to the time I was Paris correspondent in 1989, when he was finally arrested. And we did a big Newsnight piece on him. And in the course of it, one of the prosecutors said to us, so you really should go and see this guy who lives just outside Lyon, who's come forward with some crucial evidence. Um, so we pulled up at this ex former communist resistance fighters farm and he said um he said have you got a bit of time i said well you know you know as long as it takes and he said well the thing is i've never told anybody my story uh not even my children but i want to tell you because you're from the bbc and he then unfolded this wonderful story. The, the scene that really caught my imagination was he, he'd been he'd been arrested and was due to be executed. And he described how in prison on the night before you were going to be killed, people would sing songs to keep up their spirits. And if you were a communist like him, you'd sing the, the red flag. If you were a, a gaullist, you'd sing the Marseillaise. He said one of the group who was arrested with him and was due to be shot was a trained opera singer and sang Cavaradossi's aria from Tosca the night before he's killed. And he described how even the German guards went quiet listening to this voice. And indeed, the next he escaped and the other guy was killed. Um, So it's a very sort of moving event. But I thought, you know, what what was it about the BBC that it, it induced this extraordinary response years later? that he would talk to us and tell us things that he'd never told um, his own children. And that's really when I began to dig away, or at least to think about digging away a bit more deeply into the BBC's wartime story. And I think the French dimension of it is is particularly moving. Um, You see the letters in the written archives down at Caversham, which was sent by people from occupied France to Broadcasting House, 
um, really saying, you know, you keep hope alive. Uh, but also crucially saying we listen to you because you tell the truth. And that's a big part of the story. I think the discovery of the power of the truth actually is a weapon of war in this case because um, it became immensely uh, important in the politics of France and in sort of fostering the resistance in France and fostering a sense that that there was a possible different future and that we might win and so forth. And in undermining the authority of the, of the Vichy regime, which persistently lied to people, and they then turned the BBC on and the other truth. So that was my starting point to what was, of course, a much bigger project. If you, if you go to the Invalides, which is the French equivalent of the Imperial War Museum, there's a whole section on the BBC and the role it played, um, which is extraordinary. Really. I mean, we don't have that here, but they do in Paris. <laughs> In, in this podcast project we've been doing, we've been focusing on the 20s, a little in the 30s. Yeah. But it seems that the BBC going into the Second World War seemed very different to the BBC coming out of it and that actually well, it had a new um, place in society, maybe. I don't know. The, the really sort of extraordinary thing one has to reflect on is it very nearly didn't um, go into the war at all because the, um, the, the RAF were extremely concerned that the transmission masks would be used by the Germans by the Luftwaffe to help guide them in on bombing raids. And there was a big debate in the late 30s about whether the BBC should simply be closed down completely and taken off the air. The idea that it might be important for morale kind of won out. Uh, and the way they did it um, was that they, they merged the regional and national transmission uh, signals so that it was just one signal, which meant that you could, if you had to switch off a transmitter because there was a bombing raid in progress, people could still hear on the next one because it was on the same wavelength. Um, and that was what actually led to the creation of the Home Service, which in turn is what led to the creation of Radio 4. So in, in a dim sort of way, you can argue that Hermann Goering you know, created the archers. I mean, you can sort of <laughs> make a slightly silly connection connection there. Yeah, I suppose uh, the, the fate of, of the BBC, British Broadcasting and all that is is out of its own hands in that sense when, it, when a crisis like that comes along. It's worth mentioning then, that the, so the BBC, of course, we think of it now as a very global thing, but actually part of this, uh, the war effort of the BBC, I guess, is you do have this uh, more more global service, don't you, that in, in different languages, and it's in, suddenly now in French and German and Italian um, to, to help spread word of what's going on. Well, that goes back really to the Munich crisis, you know, the first sort of war, when, when um, because of the, of the international nature of that crisis, the, the BBC thought it would be helpful to do broadcasts in uh, French and German uh, and Italian. Uh, and that's when the language services really began to take off. There had been the Empire service, of course, which broadcast to British colonies around well, but it was really only with Munich that, that the, the European services took off. And they just snowballed like, like crazy during the war because it became apparent how, how valuable they were um, as, a, as a way of talking to the people of occupied Europe. France being the sort of initial and obvious example, but, um, you know, Italy, um, Central Europe, or, or, all the, or, you know, all the areas under Nazi control. That was the way you could... Um, you could reach them. And one of the striking things about the Board of Governors uh, meetings during that period is they spent all their time buying new buildings. I mean, the BBC was expanding so fast that they couldn't get the accommodation quickly enough. Um, and, and, and I mean, Bush House, of course, was bought during that period, but now sadly no longer part mm. of the BBC. That sort of that extraordinary place that became such a, um, a hub of world culture um, in, in the best days of the world service that was acquired then uh, but uh, you know country houses everything partly because they also had to ship people out, out of London because London was thought to be dangerous so mansions all over the shop were, were being bought up to house the, the staff yeah some of them shipped out was it Bristol wasn't it they they went out there fairly early on I think and um... yeah Bristol was was very big um, and Bristol uh, it's, it, you, you can still see this um, although it's a little bit different range but they they built an underground broadcasting center in Bristol um, in what had been a funicular railway system going up just near the suspension bridge but all underground 
Um, and the theory was that if, if the worst happened and the Germans invaded, the BBC would um, retire into this bunker where they had a sort of enormous stock of records, a piano, um, and lots of, sort of tinned food and so forth. And the idea they would they would hunker down there and keep the broadcasting going. As you said, there are many different directions it could have gone in, I suppose, but actually it's it responded in a way that seemed to uh, engender trust with society and its listeners. Well, I think I think part of the thing one needs to remember is that nobody had uh, experienced broadcasting war before. I mean, there was you know no, nothing like that during the First World War, and so people were making things up. Um, as they went along, and they suddenly found that this amazingly flexible media could do all sorts of extraordinary things that nobody had really imagined, including in the French context, of course, reaching behind enemy lines and talking directly to people, which is is a huge change, if you think about it, from the way warfare was conducted. No, nothing like that could have happened before. But also that it it, it was very valuable having a single voice that the nation trusted and through which the government and other people could could really address the nation. And I suppose a good example of that was uh, the spring of 1940, when the Germans broke through in Western Europe. And at the end of May, of course, there was Dunkirk and we were up against it. And in a way, the two voices that really kept the nation going during that period, very different voices, but were Churchill, of course, whose great speeches, some of whose great speeches uh, were broadcast um, on the BBC. After the smoke of the battlefield had cleared away, the horrid shape which had cast its shadow over the whole continent had vanished and was gone forever. And J.B. Priestley, who the writer, novelist, who delivered these extraordinary things known as postscripts, which went out uh, after the news, usually on Sundays, he managed to capture the nation's mood and spirit. The part played in the difficult and dangerous embarkation. And one of the most famous is his first one, which was immediately after Dunkirk. Not by the warships, magnificent though they were. When he talked about little boats. But by the little pleasure steamers. Which went over to France to rescue soldiers. And he had a house on the Isle of Wight. So he actually regularly travelled in one of the ferries that in fact went off um, to France. And I think was, was, was sunk. So it's very personal to him. We've known them and laughed at them, these fussy little steamers, all our lives. So that whole idea about Britain having been so, saved by the little boats at Dunkirk which was a bit of an exaggeration. I mean, it, it wasn't quite like that. But 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 that whole myth was created by the priestly broadcast immediately after Dunkirk had happened. And he describes giving it and coming out of the studio and seeing old sort of old BBC hand with tears in his eyes. And our great grandchildren may also learn how the little holiday steamers made an excursion to hell and came back glorious. So suddenly they found that this thing, this medium, which many of them distrusted, could do something really rather remarkable. Uh, there's so many areas, even within that, I just, I just my brain spinning off going, do we talk about Churchill? And almost Churchill versus Reith, who I guess was sort of almost out of the picture by this point. Uh, and equally the war, thinking, I'm comparing in my mind, like Dunkirk versus, for example, D-Day, when I think you, in the book it says that, uh, that Dunkirk didn't have any, there was no war reporting from Dunkirk no. as such, was no, there? That, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, I mean, if you go, if you look at the the scripts, the new scripts during um, Dunkirk, they are thick with the censors' pencil, uh, and that wasn't done with resistance from the BBC. The censors very often were BBC staff, um, but clearly there was a real clampdown on on the way that was reported. Churchill. Uh, in cabinet said that when I think the Ministry of of Information, Duff Cooper, suggested that people ought to be allowed to know a bit more about what was happening at Dunkirk so it wouldn't come as too much of a shock when the scale of the defeat became apparent, said, no, I want want no reporting of this at all. And and the word Dunkirk doesn't feature in any reports until everybody's well and truly home. It's it's fascinating um, to read that. Um, And I think that, that to some extent reflects the still then in official circles, the distrust of the medium and the fear that um, it could damage morale rather than rather than um, supporting it. But it's quite interesting to see how 
how the BBC kind of overcame people's, the audience's suspicion that they were too much of an official mouthpiece. There's a very famous broadcast during the Battle of Britain by a chap called Gardner, who had his recording van on the seafront during a dogfight in the Battle of Britain. Now the Germans are dive-bombing a convoy out in the sea. And he described it. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven German dive-bombers, Junkers 87. There's As one if it was a kind of football now. match. It was very, very vivid. There you can hear our anti-aircraft going in. You're now. seeing the, the German planes shot. There's one coming down in flames. There's somebody's hit a German and he's coming and down. There's a long Bombing street. a British convoy of, of ships and did they miss? Yes, they're, they're being chased home and, and how they're being chased Tremendously. It is it's like a, a football commentator in, in its oh, tone. Oh, boy, look at them going. And look how the missions... And it was an extraordinarily successful broadcast everybody in the country was talking about it in the you know work the following day oh boy i've never seen anything so good as this uh, and the bbc did a bit of a study to work out what it was that had caught people's imagination and certainly the vividness of it was part of it the raf fighters have really got these boys but a number of people said to them when they interviewed them the thing is he was obviously recording that as it happened so it couldn't have been doctored it couldn't have been altered by the census, it must have been the truth, um, and that those kind of lessons the BBC gradually learned as the as the war, you know, went on. How you could earn people's trust and how people did respond to these things, and there were all sorts of tensions as well. One of the things, the political aims during that early period was, of course, to get the Americans on side in the war, and. Therefore, enormous help was given by the BBC on the government's instructions to American correspondents to report uh, the Battle of Britain and then the Blitz. And Ed Murrow, who you may have heard of, a famous um, correspondent, who believed passionately that America should come on Britain's side, and he, he produced these wonderful broadcasts, very, very vivid, standing on the top of a broadcasting house during a bombing raid, which is a dangerous thing to do. I'm standing on a rooftop looking out over London. At the moment... Everything is quiet. Describing the sirens and the and the, 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 the searchlights and the bombs falling. Now you'll hear two bursts a little nearer in a moment. There they are. That hard, stony sound. Really, really magnificent stuff. And it, and it did have an effect. And in the end, of course, Britain, uh, America did indeed come in on our side but the BBC saw during that period that one thing they couldn't do was censor the American correspondence too rigorously because the most damaging thing would be an American correspondent turning to his audience and saying I can't say things because the Brits won't let me so actually the instruction went out to be very very lenient with them and they have this thing called a switch censor so all the time during all broadcasts there was somebody with their finger on a button um, who could just take the BBC off the air if they heard something that they thought was damaging. But there's a memo which says to the chap running the, the, the American uh, liaison office, just please don't use that unless it's absolutely necessary because that would be so damaging to our cause. So a lot of the political pressures built behind the idea that getting the truth out there was actually a more effective way of doing things. A little more from Edward yet to come, but can we just dwell a moment with another broadcasting history expert, the author of that doorstep of a book out this year, The BBC, A People's History. Professor David Hendy tells many a story of those individual people who helped make the BBC, including Mary Lewis, someone who had a key role in a key date of British history, D-Day. You focus in a people's history in your book on, well, it's like Mary Lewis, isn't there, in World War Two who has these these key roles suddenly in goes from the duplicating section to being there at the right moment, the right time to change history, potentially, I suppose. That's right. And, and I mean, she's there. Her account is there and we can draw on that story of what she's doing in the Second World War, partly because she becomes an even more important figure in BBC administrative hierarchy mm. <laughs> later in her career. So she earns her chance to be interviewed by Frank yeah. Gillard for the oral history archive that he's he's creating. But even though, in a, in a sense, she earns it because of that later high point in her career, it's an opportunity for us, and for me in any case, to dig back to her early 
roles in the BBC. And the duplicating section, which she helps run uh, during the Second World War, is a classic example of the, the hidden labour that goes into programme making. Part of my account of the BBC during the Second World War is the moment of D-Day. And it's a crucial moment, obviously, for, for the Allies and for Britain, and a big moment for the BBC, because the BBC would have to rise to this great occasion to satisfy the, 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 the need of the British people to kind of to follow what's happening, the Allied troops to follow what's happening, and for listeners in occupied Europe to know whether or not liberation was at hand. So it was both a momentous military occasion and an important moment for the BBC. And it's getting getting together its apparatus for, for war reporting in a really big and meaningful way, recruiting war correspondents, creating a war reporting unit, um, working hard on on shrinking the size of portable recorders so that mm. instead of it being a, a truck, it's a kind of mm. a box that can be carried by one person. Setting up a kind of elaborate machinery of mobile transmitters and, and landlines and so on to get reports back from the front to London so they could be broadcast. So all of this is happening. And of course, it's all happening in a highly secretive way, because no one must know where war correspondents are being sent to on the eve of uh, the invasion and, and, and so on. Um, and then there's this moment on the night of the 5th of June, 1944, which was the original date that the invasion was supposed to happen, but it was postponed by bad weather, when the plans, the BBC's plans for how it was going to switch over all its transmitters and the, when the announcement was going to come and what the announcement would consist of and so on. All of these have to be typed up and printed off and distributed to the key people involved. And Mary Lewis is on fire duty that evening, just casually doing some stapling and, and so on, when she gets a phone call and it's Benji Nichols, an important kind of um, senior figure who's kind of guarding these plans. Uh, and he says to her, can you type something up? And she looks at them and realises how important these documents are. They're basically the plans for D-Day. And um, so she gets rid of the other uh, people in her firewatch party and gets down to the duplicating section. Uh, and prints them off and A is rewarded for her efforts with two eggs <laughs> from Benji Nichols. Wow. Um, and, and then she's kind of working flat out actually through the rest of the night and actually pretty well through the rest of the day because the following day, the day of the invasion itself, um, is going to be the first day of the BBC's new series, War Report. War Report number one, the story of D-Day which is that sort of, you know, nightly showcase of, of up-to-date reports from the different parts of the battlefront and so on. Throughout the day, the British Broadcasting Corporation has been telling the world that Allied forces have crossed the channel into France. Which is going to run almost continuously until peace is declared in Europe in 1945. With every arm of the liberating forces went a BBC correspondent, and soon after the assault was launched, their reports began to come in. This is invasion day, it's just before dawn, and we're on our way over to the coast of France to bomb an important bridge. 24 hours later, there's Mary Lewis again, still at the duplicating machines, churning out the scripts and the running orders for the first edition of, of war reporting and, and being kind of kept going only through drinking little nips of whiskey uh, that has been pinched from the pockets of sleeping war correspondents. <laughs> so, uh, so um, yeah, I mean, you know, what would have happened without Mary Lewis yeah. that, that, that night? Um, and, of course, she's because she's there, she's an extraordinary witness to a lot of the things that are happening. We get from Mary Lewis's oral history account vivid descriptions of the night on Tuesday, the 15th of October, 1940, that an enormous bomb drops on Broadcasting House and causes immense damage. Seven people are killed, 23 people injured. Um, extraordinary drama. And she's one of the witnesses that we have for that occasion. So, so yeah, these are, you know, 
the Mary Lewises are just as important to the BBC story as the kind of Al Gilbert's. That was David Hendy, author of The BBC A People's History. We'll have plenty more to come from David on future episodes of the podcast, including in a few episodes time, you'll hear many familiar voices. We're planning for the centenary itself, an episode I'm going to call 100 Years in 100 Minutes. If you would like to get your voice on the podcast, can you pick a year, pick a moment from broadcasting history, record a voice memo? It could be about the goons, the pythons, the launch of the television service, a favourite memory of childhood of watching Grandstand and watch with mother or birds of a feather you choose pick a moment pick a show pick a year record a voice memo on your phone send it to me paul at paulcarenza.com you can find the link to that email address in the show notes and i'd love to get your voice on this podcast for our centenary special 100 years in 100 minutes other news while we're here, I'm still on tour doing the first broadcast, the Battle for the Beeb in 1922. Only a handful of dates left, so this autumn do catch the show, if you can, on the Isle of Wight. We're there with Tim Wonder, he'll be introducing that show. We've then got Bradford and Salford, Chelmsford, Guildford, other places that don't end in food, including Bristol and the final show, London, November the 14th on Centenary Day itself. Now, that is the last show that's scheduled, but the show is ready to go back on the road again. If you have a venue, if you have even a group of people or uh, maybe a local history society or a radio group or someone who would quite like a little talk, I'm very cheap, do get in touch. Paul at paulcarenza.com. I would love to visit where you are and put on the first broadcast, The Battle for the Beeb in 1922, as a show for you. But for now, catch me on tour, paulcarenza.com slash tour for details of those venues. You can come and see us this autumn. A last word then on Auntie's War from Edward Sturton, knowing full well that we have barely scratched the surface. Maybe as we continue the podcast, we will one day get to the 1940s and be able to tell you in a lot more detail what the BBC was up to in the Second World War. Pretty much any figure of literature or letters or journalism that you can name at some point went through the BBC during that period. I mean, the obvious great voice being, of course, um, George Orwell. Oh, yes, who, who we, and we see his statue on the way into MBH, don't we? Done by, oh, that's it happens, done by a great old friend of mine, Martin Jennings, who was a sculpture, who insisted that those words be carved into the building next to him, which are, what is it, if, if liberty means anything, it's the freedom to tell people things they do not want to hear. And it's very good for BBC bosses to walk past that every morning <laughs> and see that, that defiant declaration of... Uh, willingness to tell the truth even when it's uncomfortable. Uh, quite right, um, yes. But I mean, I think I mean he's a he's a fascinating person for all sorts of reasons. But one of them is that you you might have imagined that he'd be a pacifist, but he absolutely wasn't. He wanted to fight. Um, he couldn't fight because he'd been wounded in the Spanish Civil War, and wasn't fit enough. But he said it, it would be a hypo- hypocritical of me to argue against a war while I'm enjoying the food that's been brought across the Atlantic by sailors risking their lives to prosecute this war. And so he turned to the BBC as as a propagandist, he was quite frank about that, believing that was the best way he could sort of do his bit. There's a, there's a wonderful, I came across one wonderful document in the archives, which is a letter written between two BBC bosses, um, complaining that they haven't managed to uh, formalise his his uh, his appointment onto the staff. And in the margin, it says, um, P.S., I do wish the Academy would make up its mind. And I, you know, sort of thought, anyway, I looked at, dug around a bit in, in Orwell's own writings and, and established that the Academy was code for MI5. Ah. So the spooks were, were sort of thinking a bit about whether it was a good idea to have him on the air. Alas, none of George Orwell's broadcasts are known to have survived. It's one of the great gaps in the broadcast archives. But the scripts do exist, so you can read them and imagine George Orwell's voice in your head. Of course, without George Orwell, we wouldn't have television show titles, including Big Brother and Room 101. It's said that while George Orwell was at the BBC, with its corridors and bureaucracy, that he got the idea for Room 101. No comment. He only gave up, really, because it became apparent that he was doing broadcasting to Asia and writing broadcast to Asia. It became apparent that in contrast to um, Europe, it wasn't, BBC broadcasting wasn't really having a huge 
impact in, in Asia, mostly because people were too poor to have radios. Okay. And, you know, by, by this stage in Europe, most families had access to them, even if they'd never one themselves. There was one in the local pub. But in India, it wasn't like that. And so, you know, it wasn't, his, his words weren't having quite the impact that he, that he hoped. It's a thoroughly researched book, but it's accessible, isn't it? It's marvellously accessible. And well, that's clearly, kind. Uh, a couple of names particularly, that, that what's lovely is the personal stories as well, like Richard Dimbleby comes through it, of course, um, yeah. as a name. And Guy Byam as well was a name I didn't know. No, but, um, extraordinary figure. Wonderful. It starts on an airfield, this story. It starts on an airfield where the paratroops kneel round their padre in prayer before him planing. With bent heads and on knees, on bent knees, the men with their equipment and camouflaged faces look like some strange creatures from another world. And darkness comes over the airfield and the men swing their explosives and weapons around them, get into their parachutes and emplane. They are going to jump, carrying heavier loads than any army has ever done before. Extraordinary and tragically, killed 26 i think in a in an air raid on berlin having um survived all sorts of things including uh d-day and crucially a bridge too far arnhem and i, and I think i mean the, the, his dispatch from arnhem which he recorded after swimming the rhine to escape somehow got back to back home i think is one of the you know one of the really great i sort of wish i wish i'd done it myself do you know what i mean it's one you read it and you think what a hell of a story, but also what a way to write it. I mean, I think, I think some of them were really amazing. Thank you, Edward Sturton. For more of him, do join us next episode. Hear him and Tim Wonder on the flip side of radio in World War II, the fascinating tale of black propaganda from both sides in the war, conniving radio messages sent from Germany into Britain, from Lord Haw Haw, and from Britain into Germany and occupied Europe, from various ex-BBC staff, familiar names like Hilda Matheson and the Eckersleys. I was going to roll it all into this episode, but there are so many great tales, and also, technically, it's not the BBC in World War II. So join us next time for that. I'll have the episode with you very shortly. Edward Sturton's book, of course, is Auntie's War, and David Hendy's book is the BBC, A People's History. And our previous guests of these summer specials, Stephen Bourne, Sarah Jane Stratford, the links to their books are in the show notes. Do go and get one of these books now and add it to your reading list. And my new book, Auntie and Uncles, it's not out yet. I'm still writing it, but it should be up by the end of the year. Uh, more details on that. If you join my mailing list, the link to that is in the show notes. My mailing list update goes out once a month. If you really like the show, patreon.com slash Paul Carenza helps keep us in business. And for £5 a month, I also record a special videos for you and written updates of behind the scenesy things to do with this podcast. And of course, your support is always welcome. It keeps us in books. And as you can tell on this podcast, we love books. The British Broadcasting Centre is presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. Original music is by Will Farmer. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at BB Century, but you won't find us on the BBC website. We're nothing to do with them, you know. Archive clips are either public domain, as far as we know, due to age, or they may belong to some people who we can't trace. If that's you, we humbly apologise. We bow to your every whim, and clips are very removable, if you just say. Any BBC content is used with kind permission. BBC copyright content reproduced courtesy of the British Broadcasting Corporation. All rights are reserved. Stay informed, educated and entertained and join us next time for more broadcasting in World War II and have a propaganda into radio as propaganda. Next time on the British Broadcasting Century.